What is the story behind the logo that you use in your intros? Where did it come from? That's, that logo is called the meaning of music and it's actually a sculpture that I made in 1985 that's about five and a half feet by half, five and a half feet and about eight inches thick and it's made out of foam core which is this it's a sub it's a material that's often used as a backing for paintings or for when you get them framed it's it's styrofoam sheet about a quarter of an inch thick with paper on both sides and you can cut it very accurately with an exacto knife and so what I did was make a stack of those um, of uh, those foam core sheets about eight inches high and I made the thing in quarters and so that it would fit together on the wall because it would have been too big to maneuver easily and um, it's a very complicated um, image it's actually a three-dimensional representation of a it's a three-dimensional representation of a two-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional object and that four-dimensional object you could think of as it's a representation of time and space and I can tell you I kind of have to hint at what the the painting means it or the sculpture it means the same thing that music means you know how music unfolds and then something else unfolds within it and then it unfolds again within it like a rose opening into the into the day or like a lotus flower that sort of comes up from the darkest depths up through the dark water and then blooms on the on the surface of the water in the sun and that's where the Buddha you know um, what would you say symbol symbolically rests. so you can imagine that thing opening and then imagine that that's what that painting is an image of and that's the same thing as music so it's a Mandela image and for Jung the Mandela was a symbol of the self and the self was something that unfolds like music which is actually why we like music and it's like the the rose the, the rose that you see, the, the, the geometric rose that you see in stained glass, it's the same thing. Um, that's the stained glass window that Pinocchio's reprehensible compatriot, um, what's his name, Lampwick, breaks when he's in Pleasure Island and he throws a rock to destroy the model home and to demolish the substructure of Western civilization. And so I had a very intense religious experience at one point when I was contemplating that so when I drew the image to begin with I drew it in about 10 minutes kind of rough and then I used a straight edge to straighten it all up and a and a protractor to or a compass to make the curves but I drew it very quickly and I'd been thinking about I'd been reading Jung a lot at that point like for for months months of intense reading and that image sort of popped out of me very um, very suddenly but it took about three months to make the actual image and then I had only a quarter of it hanging on my wall because it was so big and I had finished it after about three months of work. So this was back in 1985 when I was a graduate student. And I was listening to the Jupiter Symphony, which is the piece of music that I use, um, that was used for the intro to my, to my videos. And it's a Mozart symphony. And this happened, man. So this happened. So I was really watching that um, Mandela, that quarter Mandela that I had made intensely. And listening to the music, trying to understand what the music, music was signifying, you know, because music has intrinsic meaning which is a very strange thing now the part of the reason for that is that language has meaning and our language has a musical quality right and that's processed mostly by the right hemisphere so that when people speak there's a there's a melody in their language and that carries a lot of the emotional import and then what musicians have done is figured out how to use that 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 musical faculty let's call it that non-semantic musical faculty to sort of purely denote meaning that's part of what music means and so but I, I was still trying to understand what the meaning was you know be, what because it's nonverbal the, the meaning of music and I was trying to figure out how to articulate that and that's partly why I made the the sculpture was to to get a grip on it and to understand it and anyways I was uh, really really concentrating hard on that Mandela and and that sculpture and I had been working on it intensely for about three months you know so that's a lot of meditation on a single idea and I was standing in my living room and then I had this very strange experience I, I, and I, I can't explain this properly because there's no way of really describing it but I, I'll do my best so you know in those Renaissance paintings sometimes you see well first of all you see great cloud great great sunny skies with with massive uh, what stupendous impressive billows of clouds and then light shining through the sunlight shining through in streams sometimes that's captured very beautifully by especially English later 
later artists usually that are later than the Renaissance, but you see it in Renaissance paintings too. And you all you also see in 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 Renaissance paintings, especially in the earlier phase of the Renaissance, the sky opening up and God sort of peering forth through the clouds. And that's exactly what seemed to happen to me is that I had this sense, it was like a vision, although I was still in my living room and knew it, but inside the theater of my imagination, I could feel the the sky opening up. Now, it wasn't the sky, it was, I would say, the only way I can really think about it is that it was something like another dimension. And then I could feel this force descend upon me, which I think was something that, you know, would have been considered classically something like the Holy Ghost, I suppose. And it filled me with this intense sense of, 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 of paradisal, uh, paradisal, I don't know how to say it. Uh, well, it was like being in heaven for some, some, some brief period of time and I could feel myself transformed, transmuted as a consequence of this experience and, and it was as if I was in the presence of something that was a living, you know, and I, I suppose that was an experience of God if you want to put it that way. Um, that's certainly what it seemed like and, and I felt that I could live that way, I could live transfigured like that permanently if I desired it and I thought, my God, I wouldn't be able to walk down the street in this sort of elevated state, let's say. I, I don't know how I would act, I don't know how I would interact with people, I don't know how people would interact with me, I just don't think that I could do it. And then I felt that whatever had descended, it seemed that as if it was sorrowful and it, and it, and it departed from me slowly. And um, with no, like with no punitive intent, and, and I wouldn't say with any dissatisfaction, it was as if a gift had been offered that I wasn't in no position to receive. And uh, I went, I talked to my wife soon afterwards, I shook for about, physically, for about half an hour after that uh, experience, like like I was shaking, you know, like, like, like you shake after a car accident, if you've ever been in a car accident, and my pupils were completely dilated, and I had a couple of experiences like that, like echoes of it a couple of times after that, and so, anyways, that was a very, very powerful experience, I've certainly never forgotten that, and, um, well, you know, I don't know, I don't know what to think about that, I mean, God only knows what the world is really like, that's for sure. And I've had a variety of very strange experiences that have convinced me that we know very little about anything. So.